Hi, I'm Dave Stouffer. Welcome to J.C.'s World, a reading from the novel The Reverend Mr. J.C. When Appearances Are Not Enough, written by me, Dave Stouffer. Thanks for being here. If you remember from our last visit to J.C.'s World, he had been left on his own to handle all the ministerial duties for the Prophetstown Trinity Church congregation. That led to a painful, beautiful experience for J.C. So where was Pastor James? Well, he was at a military reunion. He's a veteran of the Korean conflict. When he comes back home to Prophetstown, J.C. asks him, Could you tell me what it was like, James? How it was to be with your buddies last week? James put down his fork. John, I told you when I decided to call you John that I'd tell you about the John that I knew who was closer to me than a brother. I haven't been completely honest with you. I feel bad about that. You see, John, I've known about you since you were a little boy. J.C. stared at James. What? How? Your dad is the John I knew and loved. We didn't see each other much when we got back from Korea, but I knew you were around. You knew my dad. Since our first day in basic training, we sat next to each other in the barber chairs. Your dad had beautiful long hair, just like yours. The next thing you knew, we were looking at two eggs, brown up to the hairline, where we'd been working outdoors, then white the rest of the way up. We looked in the mirror, caught sight of each other's faces, and just started to laugh. Everything was alphabetical, so we didn't bunk close to each other, but that night I got up to use the latrine and your dad was in there too. So I said, I'm James Edwards from Junction City, Kansas. And he says, I'm John Wesley from Holly Springs, Missouri. And James, I don't think I've ever seen anybody so funny looking without their hair. I said, John, I could tell you were proud of those beautiful long locks of hair. And when I saw you with them laying there on the floor, I couldn't help but laugh. I hope I didn't hurt your feelings. Basic training is a hard place to grow a friendship, but the ones you make there last a lifetime. I was always made fun of because I was farm fresh and not worldly, and I didn't mind talking about God. They called us Jesus freaks. Your dad wasn't a Jesus freak. He was just a good man. Me being right off the farm, I could put on a fresh pair of pants in the morning, and by noon I looked like I fell off the back of a truck. Your dad. I've never seen anybody who always looks spit-shined. All his badges in the right place, cap at the right angle. He'd take my boots and polish them, give me ideas for how I could keep a press in my pants, tell me when to get a haircut. And toward the end of basic training, we had to decide what to do. There were no guarantees, but they wanted you to think you had a choice. I knew I wanted to do construction. We had a neighbor with a bulldozer, and I loved that. Your dad didn't know, but had seen the work around Fort Leonard Wood, and he thought that riding in a truck would be good, so we both got sent to the Corps of Engineers. One of the reasons your dad made sergeant so fast was because he looked and acted the part of a leader. He'd walk into a room, and somehow people would just know that this was the guy who knew what they were supposed to be doing, and more than that, knew exactly how to get it done. Your dad took to the military like a duck to water. He was always in the right place at the right time, in the right uniform, looking sharp. But you know, we balanced each other out pretty good. There wasn't a tool or piece of heavy equipment I couldn't run. And your dad, he knew all the regulations, all the book learning, all the chain of command. So we went off to the Corps of Engineers and then we went to Korea. It was Korea where your dad saved my life. Warfare, John, has changed some over the years. It used to be one side, well, they'd stand in one place, and the other side would stand in another place, and they'd try to kill each other. And there were rules. You couldn't be here, you couldn't be there, you couldn't do this. Before a certain time, you couldn't do that. And I guess nobody gave the book to the North Koreans. They were everywhere. There were no rules. You could be working in the most safe, secure place, and all of a sudden be fighting for your life. The Corps of Engineers, John, builds things. They build buildings, dams, 
highways, and airfields. We were working on an airfield, one that had been torn up by bombs. I was at one end of the strip with a group of guys and we were surveying and pounding out stakes so the road graders and dozers could come along and make it straight and flat again. Your dad was running a bulldozer. He was off to the side of us when all of a sudden some North Korean soldiers decided that'd be a good place to start a war. They threw a couple of grenades to get our attention and then started shooting. We all jumped into a bomb crater. Thank goodness we hadn't filled it up yet, but we were pinned down. And it probably wouldn't have been too long before those North Korean soldiers figured out how to get their guns to a higher position so they could shoot down into the crater. Looked to me like we were between a rock and a hard place. Then I heard the roar of a big cat. And I looked over the edge of the crater and saw a big pillar of black smoke. Caterpillar dozers don't have cabs. The driver just perched on top, pretty exposed. But your dad had that caterpillar and road gear heading our way. As he was driving along, I noticed a blade on that thing was coming up. Your dad figured if he got the blade up in front of him, he could still kind of see where he was going, and it would act as a shield. Well, he came around to the side of the bomb crater and put the dozer between us and the fire, and that really made him mad. All you could hear was the pings and clangs of bullets flattening themselves against the blade of that dozer. Next thing I know, here's John, blade still up in the air, running over the back of the cat, down into the hole with us. Preacher, he says to me, I got an idea. I'll get back up on that dozer. You arrange your guys behind it, staying within the edges of the blade. And we'll just take a little ride toward where those guys are. See if we can scare them a little bit. Put the fear of God into them, James. Well, what do you think? Well, the kind of man your dad was. Every man in that hold, and I guess there were six or seven of us, we just stood right up. We would have followed him into hell or wherever else he'd wanted to go. He climbed back over the back end of that dozer. That had to be uncomfortable because those big motors put out a lot of heat. Me and the other guy stood up and checked our weapons. Just as cool as a cucumber, your dad put that thing in low gear and started crawling toward the sound of that gunfire. Turns out the North Koreans had set out a little machine gun nest and there were only four or five of them. By the time we got there, John had that dozer pretty much parked over the top of where they were. Well, the short part of the story, John, is we did what we had to do. Then we went back and finished rebuilding that airstrip. But I know John, and so do those other guys, that if it wasn't for the brave, stupid thing your dad did, we wouldn't have gotten home except in a box. So when Bishop Fry asked me, and I don't think I'm being melodramatic here, John, because the way I saw it, the bishop was asking me to save your life. I didn't want to do it. Any more than I reckon your dad wanted to drive that bulldozer into a nest of Korean soldiers. But I owed him, and now I'm glad I did. I know you didn't want to do it, J.C. said quietly, then looked into James' face. But I'm curious about that. Now I'm glad I did part. Well, John, I don't want your head to get any bigger than it already is. Pretty much every day, I see more of your dad and less of the Reverend Mr. J.C. J.C. was overwhelmed. He fished out his handkerchief and blew his nose. Thank you for saying that, James. I'm sure I have tried your patience and acted the fool more than once since I've been here. Don't get too cocky, John. There's still some fool in there. So now J.C. has even more respect for Pastor James and reasons for concern, too. Pastor James has cancer. After his surgery, J.C. works hard to take good care of him, and let's be honest, J.C. is just plain working hard. J.C. looked in his home repair Simple Solutions Illustrated and found a step-by-step -step plan with pictures for an Adirondack chair. He talked to James about it, and a few days later, James carefully descended the basement steps, perched on a stool, and supervised J.C. in the making of his very first piece of furniture. Was it perfect? No. 
Did James see, see a lot of areas where he could make the next one better? Yes. Did James love it? Yeah. So manfully, J.C. picked up the chair, carried it up the steps. He grabbed a couple of pillows and asked James, could he carry the pillows if he, J.C., carried the chair? James laughed at him, and they set off across the alley to the garden. Soon James was seated comfortably in the chair, and J.C., along with a half dozen other folks, backs bent, were attacking the latest weed invasion. The next night, there was more of the same. Other lawn chairs began to appear at the patch, and Saturday afternoon a pickup truck arrived and several men unloaded a couple of homemade picnic tables. Ernie Ray, the truck driver, showed up with a metal rim from one of those big truck tires and a bunch of wood. And soon in the evenings, weeding or not, people were gathering at the patch to sit around a fire and visit. There's just something about a fire. It was on one of those evenings when J.C., trying to be funny and maybe get across a point at the same time, commented on the plethora of green beans. Everybody agreed. There were a lot of them, and a lot of radishes, and now the tomatoes were coming on, and sweet corn. The consensus was that the folks planting the gardens had been so enthusiastic that they were now harvesting much more produce than they could use themselves. Joni Ordman said her sister over in Flat Rock had told her they had a farmer's market. They sell their produce to other people who don't have gardens. What do you all think about that idea? They all thought it was a great idea. And then they all thought they'd like to try it. And then they all turned and looked at J.C. What do you think, Pastor John? Can you do it? Picture a mule on its haunches with its back hooves in the ground, being pulled by several people holding its bridle, and you'll have the picture that was in J.C.'s head at that precise moment. What did they mean, could I do it? They want it. It's their stuff. James looked up at him before J.C. had a chance to speak. We could use the tables from the church, John. Oh, Lord, he's in favor of it, too. I guess we could try it, he said. Everybody got excited. Everybody talked at the same time. Finally, J.C. got control of the group. We need to know what day of the week we're going to do this. It was finally decided that Saturday afternoon would catch most people. Ernie Ray spoke up. Pastor, you just tell us what time you need us to be at the church and we can carry the tables. Carry them where, Ernie? Well, over here. Wouldn't it make a lot more sense to have it here by the patch? J.C. thought very carefully for a minute and then said, Yes, it would. It would make a lot of sense to have it here by the patch until it rained. And then we'd have a lot of people standing around getting wet. So I'd like to suggest we have it in the fellowship hall of the church. And you all can bring a box or two of things you'd like to sell. Next, they talked about how they would price items. Rachel McGee said she was a friend of Bud down at Bud's supermarket, and she'd go talk to him. James pointed out that Bud might not be too happy about having competition. Rachel said, I don't think he'll mind at all. I'll get his ideas for what we should charge. So everything was decided and planned, and the first one was to be Saturday just three days away. I think we need to publicize it, Kathleen Saunders said. I can help. Maybe we can make some posters to put around town. So Kathleen, Rachel, and Debbie Owens agreed they'd meet together the next day and make posters. It was 9.30 when the impromptu meeting broke up. James and J.C. were walking slowly back to the parsonage. James said, You didn't really want to do that very bad, did you, John? Oh, that's okay. I could tell that you didn't. Well, it's it's just that it it's just that there seems to be a lot to do. There's the radiation treatments we're taking you to, Sunday services, all the things to do to keep the church running. J.C. was thinking as he was talking and didn't realize he'd actually said the next words until he heard James laughing. I've been a minister for fifteen years and I've never worked so hard. When he heard James laughing, a rueful smile appeared on his face. Yeah, I guess that sounded kind of bad, didn't it? Welcome to the ministry, John. 
So why did you decide to do a farmer's market? Well, the people were excited. And it wasn't just the Trinity Church members. They're from other churches or no churches. But they wanted to work together to share what they worked so hard to produce. And I guess because it wouldn't hurt some of them to have a little extra money. And there are two other reasons, James. Oh, I just felt like it ought to be done. J.C. opened the back door of the parsonage so James could go in. Well, what's the second reason, John? Well, maybe we'll get something else besides green beans for supper. So, was J.C.'s impulse to open a farmer's market a good idea? Well, like most projects, it gets complicated. Most days when he wasn't tired from the radiation, James would pull together last night's leftovers and have them ready on the table at lunchtime. Then the two men would sit and compare notes about the morning and its activities. This noon, James led off by saying, well, that farmer's market of yours has run into its first snag. Farmer's market of mine? J.C. thought it had sprung fully formed from someone else. Run into a snag? Well, John, I don't think it's a major snag, but it's something that needs to be thought about. Sally Tidball dropped by this morning. J.C. said, I hate to sound selfish, but I hope she brought cookies or cinnamon rolls. I just love her cinnamon rolls. Therein lies the rub. Sally has heard about the farmer's market. She counted off to me on two hands worth of fingers, the ladies and some gentlemen who make wonderful baked goods, homemade bread, pies, cakes, cinnamon rolls, cookies. You know Belle Farrell of the Spruce Street Girls who makes those snickerdoodles she loves so much? Sally said, why can't those people be part of the market too? I told her I'd have to consult with you because you were in charge. In the poem, The Christmas Story, Clement Clark Moore describes the children with visions of sugar plums dancing in their heads. If you substitute cinnamon rolls, snickerdoodles, fresh fruit pies, and angel food cakes for sugar plums, you'd have a pretty good idea of the pictures revolving in J.C.'s mind. Well, um, um, well, I see, that is a um, snag. J.C. tried to keep his voice disinterested. I, I suppose I'd have to talk to the rest of people on the market committee from the patch, but, uh, you know, they appointed me to be in charge. I say yes. Go for the goodies. I figured you'd feel that way, said James, so I told Sally to go ahead and get it lined up. I guess what you're trying to tell me, John, is if it's a choice between snickerdoodles and green beans, Snickerdoodles win every time. That night, J.C. talked to the other people who formed the first Farmer's Market Committee, and they all agreed that including homemade things would be okay. James had taken a phone call from Mrs. Martinez, who went to the Prophetstown Church of God, where they had a Spanish-speaking service. Mrs. Martinez asked if she could bring her homemade salsa. It seems she knew folks who were growing tomatoes and peppers favored for Hispanic cooking. So mixed in with the Trinity Church people were Methodists, Presbyterians, Church of God people, a couple of folks from Sacred Heart, and a couple of people with no church home as far as J.C. knew. There was every kind of produce out of the patch, as well as salsa and homemade tamales, apple pies, strawberry pies, cookies of all sizes, shapes, and variety. <sighs> Saturday afternoon came. And the basement fellowship in Trinity Church was a beehive of activity. Luckily, there were enough tables for everyone. And it was all laid out so neatly. Obviously, the folks there as vendors were proud of what they'd accomplished. At one o'clock precisely, he was in the entryway to the church, pulling the bell rope. All of the posters had said the ringing of the church bell would be the opening of God's market. He didn't know who thought that up, but it sounded good to him. Four hours later, the place was a shambles. Tables were for the most part bare. They'd run out of saved grocery sacks several times. Finally, J.C. had gone to Bud's supermarket to try to buy some. Bud handled him a tall stack, saying, Here, they've got my name on them, if you don't mind. J.C. had thanked Bud for being so understanding. Bud said, No. 
It's a good thing for me. If people have more money, maybe they'll spend more in my store. He insisted on carrying the sacks back to the church for J.C. and after a while asked if he could use the phone. He called his store to get a couple of the employees to carry some of the fresh produce back to his store to put up for sale. J.C., this stuff's a lot fresher, a lot better looking than some of the stuff I get in. You going to do this every week? Well, bud, we're going to do it until the last things quit growing, I guess. It looks to me like it's been successful. Well, that's great, Pastor John. That's great. You let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Now, excuse me. There's an apple pie over there with my name on it. J.C. has changed in so many ways from the stuck-up, stuck-in-his-ways man who came to Provincetown a year ago. The question now is, can he keep his balance? taking care of Pastor James and taking the workload they both had carried? If you enjoy these glimpses into Provincetown and J.C.'s world, please join me again. Thanks for coming. I'm Dave Stoker.